Hello comic fans, here's Earl Grey and this is my second stack of favorite comics, comic book series, collected editions, graphic novels, what have you, from 2021. And these are the ranks from 40 to 31. And so let's start with uh, rank 40. And this is, I guess, the most recent uh, collection of TMNT by IDW, volume uh, 12. So, and I breezed more or less through these, this dirty dozen of uh, turtle lore, enjoyed some of the stories a um, bit more. Uh, some art spoke more to me than other art, but overall it's highly enjoyable uh, stuff. Very whimsical, hilarious, um, yeah, good adventures uh, with yeah, bringing a bit of this um, Silver Age spirit in, in into our grim and gritty days, <laughs> maybe. So, and oh, uh, next book here, uh, 39, I did recently a video about the Nocturnals by uh, Dan Brereton, um, about this bunch of creatures of the night from another dimension who had to fight it out with the mobsters and... Um, and other monsters and androids and uh, stuff like that. And <laughs> if the art is nothing for you, I mean, the, this book won't do anything for you. But uh, because the art is really here, the, the factor that should pull you in and through these stories who are not so special, I mean, uh, but they have androids and monsters and the gun witch. On 38, we have Li Aristocratici, an Italian comic series. This is the German version, of course, uh, The Gentleman Gambia, published by the little publisher Phoenix Comics. Uh, this is a series that uh, yeah, is a part of my childhood um, because I really love this gang of novel uh, thieves uh, who have a bit of this Robin Hood syndrome, uh, taking it from rich villains to give it uh, to their more or less poor victims um, back, um, but always keeping 10% as some kind of a charge for their endeavors. So they're not really on the legal side, but uh, they're heroes, nevertheless, heroes from my childhood. And so I'm very thankful that we have now the second volume of the series and more to come. On 37, we have one of these fascinating uh, adaptations of Lovecraft lore by Gu Tanabe, uh, and this is The Call of Cthulhu. Not necessarily because uh, this is the best of the series, still uh, I would recommend uh, picking up The Mountains of Madness first, but The Mountains of Madness, these two volumes uh, were published in 2020, at least the German ones, and this German edition of uh, The Call of Cthulhu was published published in 2021. So there you go. I had to include some uh, one of these books here uh, because they're really yeah, uh, good uh, examples of what you can do with uh, Lovecraft stories. I mean, of course, a bit gory and uh, very sinister. Another series of thick books that I highly enjoyed. Um, even though this uh, series here obviously uh, fetched a bit more money out of my pocket, is the Neil Gaiman Library. This is volume three, with four complete books in one volume. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, the first series was not my favorite one of the four books in it. Uh, it's fascinating art, really perfect and bit too perfect. The story is a fairy tale with some vampire twist in it, uh, but I don't know. Uh, some pages felt a bit like overdone kitsch to me, especially with the computer coloring that, that didn't blend too well uh, with the art. And sometimes you can't say, just say that this is bad. This is <laughs> jaw-droppingly beautiful in, in a way, but yeah. I don't know. Um, it's it's really yeah something else I, I have to say. 
But I enjoyed overall the stories that were drawn by P. Craig Russell and uh, Michael Zuli in the end and Scott Hampton a lot more. Um, and they had really this, um, yeah, whether you like it or not, I, I like Neil Gaiman and his melancholy and his laconic voice uh, in these stories. Um, even though you have sometimes a bit like here, um, the problem or the inclination of uh, the cartoonists to keep uh, as much of these precious Neil Gaiman sentences as possible. And so it feels a bit like illustrated um, story to me. Um, same with the American gods, but here the art is in these stories uh, better, much better. And um, so sort of uh, the, the experiment to blend Neil Gaiman with um, pictures and text uh, is more successful overall. Uh, my favorite one is actually uh, the one here by, drawn by Troy Nixie, a werewolf story with a twist, uh, the end of the world again. On 35, we have Six Sidekicks of Trigger Keaton. This is one of the two comic book series that I had to include here in my top 50 list. Um, it's written by Carl Starks and drawn by Chris Schweitzer with this very deliberately um, uh, undynamic line uh, style, but uh, his cartooning is not undynamic and uh, pretty interesting and uh, serves the purpose here more, th more than just serviceable. <laughs> and it's about this group of stuntmen who once worked with this uh, douchebag scumbag of an actor who misused them and abused them and put them into the hospital and one day he is found dead and uh, they don't believe that it was a suicide and now they try to figure out who killed Trigger Keaton and that's uh, the premise for a fun uh, six issue series uh, totally would be totally enjoyable in uh, in a trade I, I would uh, figure but this was really uh, stuff that was read by me uh, was on the top of on my reading uh, stack each month when I got an issue, I read it straight away and I got a bit of the excitement of the Wednesday Warriors from uh, the other side of the pond. Some other comic books uh, still wait to be read by me, uh, for instance, um, and, and most notably uh, The Dreaming, The Waking Hours. I didn't have uh, managed to read that series. When they're piling up, you know, then uh, it's just... Yeah, finding the right time when you can binge through all of them. On 34, we have a child of our virus written times, and that's Mike Mignola's Quarantine Sketchbook. Uh, Mignola did a series of drawings, um, not all of them Hellboy related. Actually, the uh, least part of this here is really Hellboy related. Other stuff is just uh, goofy nonsense, but. Nonsense drawn by Mike Mignola is always fantastic. So uh, he did the series of drawings and they were auctioned for a good cause and they made this book out of it. Um, arguably this book could have been made differently uh, without the frame and smaller and cheaper or uh, in this size, but you could have made the drawings a bit bigger. Either way, beautiful book uh, anyways and um, very glad to have this one here. On 33 we have the real Hellboy, even though some would argue that this is not the real Hellboy because there's no Mike Mignola drawn story within this tome. Um, but I really like uh, the whole uh, Hellboy universe, even though I have to say that from all the Hellboy stories, uh, probably Sledgehammer 44, which is included here, uh, impressed me the least. It's a bit stretched out and uh, 
Yeah, kind of generic. Even though when I read reread the story in this tome here, I have to say it's cooler than I uh, remembered, uh, especially with this uh, black flame character and all. Uh, that's not too bad, I have to say. And uh, the first story was even better. But by far my favorite in this book here is The Visitor, How and Why He Stayed. Uh, that's a fantastic story and uh, maybe you have wondered uh, in uh, Seed of Destruction and Conqueror Warm what's this alien here all about. He appeared a bit out of nothing in that story and we get now the tale of this alien guy who blends with the humans and uh, was sent to Earth actually to kill Hellboy but then he uh, believed in Hellboy as a character uh, that he can improve and that he's maybe needed for humanity uh, and so on. And so we see his life and we see uh, Hellboy's life um, from outs uh, an outside perspe perspective and it's just heartwarming, fun, one of these stories that really uh, makes the whole Hellboy universe so special and, and showcase what you can do with it. Um, the art was, by the way, by Paul Grist, um, who start, started the series pretty Mike Mignola-ish, but later on um, was bold enough and for good reasons uh, to, to develop or to put out his own cartooning style. On 32, we have the next iteration of Data Loss by Charles Burns, uh, Volume 2. Uh, for whatever and mysterious reasons, uh, this book has only been published yet uh, in French and German, and maybe other uh, languages, I don't know, but uh, not in English, um, which is a bit crazy, given the um, importance and fame of Charles Burns. Um, the story here is a mix, I would say, between uh, Black Hole and X the x Out trilogy. So we have again a coming-of-age story um, combined with some horror elements, but they are toned down and the crazy um, part is a bit toned down and it's still more a coming-of-age story of these teenagers with some disturbing elements, of course. But it's still not as crazy as x out else it would uh, rank higher in my list, but still a uh, very fun, very good uh, book, uh, actually. And wrapping up today's part of my top 50 list here is rank 31, and that's Philippe Trier's uh, Lone Sloan Delirious 2. I guess this is the lowest ranking Philip Trier book ever in one of my lists, uh, pretty sure of course. And um, But yeah, it was done over uh, more than two decades and it really shows it's uh, more than just a bit jumpy and uh, the storytelling literally forgets his protagonists uh, towards the end. Uh, amidst all these glorious uh, double-page uh, landscapes of hellish sci-fi fantasy scenario. It's really beautiful, but the story fizzles out in the end. But uh, yeah, it, it's still Philip Trier and uh, still you have to, to, to get the stuff here. Um, maybe watch my video uh, to have a bit deeper look inside this book here and that's all for now uh, and the ranks 40 to 31 uh, and let's put them here in a more decorative fashion so that we can do a snappy come on thumbnail for it uh, I will do it <laughs> <laughs> different thumbnail anyways. Thanks for listening and watching. Goodbye.